this chapter is called The Death of God. And um, before we talk about the chapter, I kind of wanted to, let's see. Um, I wanted to give you a few definitions before we, we got started, only because there's, um, well, I, I kind of think that the, the PhD that our author was working on, I'm pretty sure, Karen Anderson, um, probably was philosophy. I mean, because that is really, I think, a lot of what the book was about. So I wanted to just give you a few definitions that I looked up. Um, these are probably Wikipedia, um, but um, some that were used a lot. And the first one was um, agnosticism. And that's someone that, that claims neither a faith, so they don't believe or disbelieve in God, but that's what an agnostic is. But most of what the chapter is about is atheism. And, and it's, it's the in the broadest sense, it's the absence of a, an existence of deities. And I looked this up in several places and they use the word deities. So, um, but, but a deity is um, a God or a supernatural being. It, it doesn't have to be in God our God that we believe in, but in any God. So atheism is just a belief that there's no God of any kind. Um, divinity is um, a, a religious being like a God or an angel. So uh, that is, is what they're talking about with divinity. And um, secular, secularism is just a separation of of state from religious institutions. And I think when I mentioned them in here, I put just a little brief uh, definition as well. And then there were three other things that were mentioned in here. And I just thought that I would bring those up as well. Uh, Judeo-Christian, and this you could, I could have written pages on because, but, but from a religious perspective, Judeo-Christian um, <clears throat> is used um, um, for a group of uh, Christianity and Judaism. And it's, it's a reference to Christianity's derivation from Judaism. So Christianity's borrowing of the Jewish scripture, the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament um, with some, some parallels either shared by two um, religions, such as like the Ten Commandments. And um, messianic is um, messianic Judaism is a modern syncretic um, Christian religious movement that incorporates some of the elements of Judaism and the Jewish tradition and evangelical Christian. And that's the definition that was Wikipedia gave. So um, I thought it was just Christian. I didn't. I'm not sure that it's just evangelical Christian, but, but, but that's what Wikipedia says. And usually they're pretty good now at validating their sources. So I'm assuming that's, that's probably more correct. And um, syncretism is, that, that was the word that was used as well, um, is just the combination of different beliefs. So in other words, messianic says syncretic Christianism. It was, it was Judaism and Christian um, combinations. So those are the, the main definitions that you'll hear throughout this chapter. And so what I did was I, I, I broke it down historically by each faith. So first we're gonna go through Christianity and then we're gonna go through Judaism. And then we're going to go through Islam and the, the, the differences in those um, religions. And to begin with, this is, Dennis talked about the Age of Enlightenment, which I, I put up here. Um, really, the Age of Enlightenment was a lot of the age of, like the age of reason and critical thinking. And um, the philosophers were always asking questions about about faith and, and other things. And that lasted until about the 1800s. And then right about the same time, the Romantic period started. And the Romantic period is kind of the area that we're gonna kind of talk about today. 
Um, and so this is a little bit more um, about uh, beauty and poetry and things like that. And you'll see how everything changes. The, the, the philosopher's theories change and, and everything else surrounding it changes too, even the way they think about God. So um, for example, and these were philosophers and scientists that, that said that there's no place for God in their reality. So you'll notice when we talk about these three religions, how they're either justifying the way they think about God um, as people are questioning it, or they're also moving away from it. Um, so so uh, the, the, the key players that um, Karen Anderson, our author, talks about are uh, Ludwig Gerbach. He's an anthropologist and a philosopher. Charles Darwin, of course, is a naturalist, a geologist, and a biologist. Um, and Karl Marx, and he's, you've all heard of him, is a German philosopher. I didn't realize he was an economist, historian, sociologist, journalist, you name it. Um, and uh, Sigmund Freud was an English neurologist, psychoanalyst, and Nietzsche who was a German philosopher. Many of the ideolo ideologies rejected God. So um, starting around the 18, or the 1900s, or, or late 1800s, um, many philosophers challenged the traditional view of God, especially the God in the West. They were offended by the supernatural deity meaning out there the idea of God being a supreme being, anthropomorphic, personal God of the Western Christendom. And a lot of these philosophers were German that were doing the questioning and they were questioning the Western Christendom. Christendom. Um, uh, natural supernaturalism was one of the themes used. Um, they used creative imagination to create new truths English Protestants weren't familiar with the, the God of the mythics, but they had already discounted them um, by, they were discounted by the reformers. So the mystics weren't really accepted by the, the Protestants or the, the reformers. So um, Jews, Muslims, and Christians had described God as nothing. Um, this was like during the Age of Enlightenment, um, rather than a supreme being, since he did not exist in any way that they could conceive, so they didn't know how to describe his physical being, so they explained it as nothing. That didn't mean that they didn't believe in him, they just didn't know how to describe him. God was becoming externalized and contributed a negative conception of, of human nature. Um, there was a lot of emphasis on guilt and sin and um, of, of God in the West, um, which was ailing to the Greek Orthodox, Orthodox theology. And again, I think it's more of the West that's getting challenged by the philosophers at this time. Catholics and Protestants regarded God as being as a being who oversaw our activities, like the celestial big brother. And again, the philosophers are starting to question why there's somebody that has control over our life. So, and, and, and as we have seen, that is one of the things that from the 18th century, that was that was something that was believed. And now they're questioning it. Many found this unacceptable because this condemned, this condemned them to unworthy dependence. Um, um, Jews and Christians had historically referred to this as, as atheists. So I think Dennis even mentioned this last last week that you know that term atheist was loosely used 
previously, and it really didn't mean the same thing. It said that that they denied pagan notions of divinity. So uh, even though they they had faith in God, pagan divinity or deity um, is is the term that they use for them. So I'm going to kind of just give you some of the players that and some of their their um, key uh, statements that they use, just so you can kind of see how this is evolving with with different um, different religious and philosophical and scientists um, and how it plays into the way they reacted to things. So William Blake was a, a mystical poet and he said God was dead. He, that, that God had died voluntarily in Jesus. He was against, in, he was also against institutional churches. And, and this is um, some of the dates I don't have when these statements were made in the book. And so what I had, she only gave the ages of the people. So this is, these are the date ranges of when they, they were living. Um, the Age of Reason, Thomas Paine argued that um, the philosophical position of deism, um, it follows in the 18th, in the tradition of the 18th century British deism and challenges institutional religion and le legitimacy of the Bible. Um, it was published in three parts. So his first part started in 1794, 95, and then into 1807. The Romantic movement pioneered by William Wadsworth um, in England celebrated the human mind and the natural world. Wadsworth was a mystic. He was careful not to, to give religious interpretations of his work, but was quite happy to talk about God. He called the presence he felt something. Then, um, then Freud came along and his belief in God, he, he said, was an illusion that a personal God was nothing more than a father figure. And this is where the control starts to come in. And the desire for a deity sprang from, from an infantile yearning for a powerful protective father. A God is a projection of the desires um, feared and worshipped by humans out of a sense of helplessness. Now that society has come of an age, religion should, should be left behind. Science, the new logos, could take God's place. Freud said it is dangerous to abolish religion and people just need to outgrow it like their own, in their own good time. So in then at the same time, Darwin comes along and his origin of the species contradicted the creation story um, in Genesis with his evolutionary theory. Also, Alfred Adler um, disagreed, but he disagreed with Freud and allowed that God was a protection, but that it had, um, it had been helpful to humanity. And then Carl Jung believed that God was similar to the God of the mystics. When asked if he believed in God, Carl said, I do not have to believe, I know. So you're, you're seeing, you know, them kind of argue a little bit both ways. So it's, it's just kind of evolving. Then Dostoevsky um, described the death of God in his novel, The Brothers um, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this very well. Um, he, his character is an atheist, Ivan, and says, if God doesn't exist, all is permitted. And he finds this God troubling because he doesn't provide the meaning for the tragedy in life. Then um, in, in 1882, uh, Frederick Nietzsche, proclaimed that God was dead. We have killed him. We're all murderers. His thought was that our science 
had changed the creation story as well as allowing us a greater control and power. So there, he's saying that we need to take the power away from God and take it under, under our control. <clears throat> Nietzsche also proclaimed the, the birth of Superman who would replace God. So the enlightened man would declare war on old Christian values and virtues of love and, and I think that's supposed to be piety, but pity? I don't know. I think it's piety. <laughs> um, believed in, um, also uh, Nietzsche believed in perpetual rebirth and found some religions uh, that are found in some religions such as Buddhism. So <clears throat> There's a lot of interesting things on that slide. Yeah. Um, I, I'm curious if you know, or if anybody knows, why Carl Jung said, I do not have to believe I know. Is, is he talking about in the mystical sense of having had an experience himself? You know, I don't know the reason, but that was a quote that, that he made. So obviously he does believe, um, but and I'm guessing probably it is it's probably a mystical experience because he is a mystic or was a mystic. Yeah. Does anybody else know the background of Young or I mean I know he psychiatry is you know he was part of the early uh, psych, psychiatric movement. Okay. He was really involved with the uh uh hip thinking about the unco your unconscious or subconscious. So mysticism, I think, might have fit in with his yeah. thinking. Yeah, that's a good point. Was he, was he the one that developed all the archetypes? Yeah. Know, the patterns of, of life that we tend to follow, that each person kind of has their own archetype that they follow. Um, I, I think he was. Is that you? Yes. Yes, he was. And he talked about the collective unconscious, that we were all connected to each other okay. with, with that spirit. And then I, I, the other thing I thought was interesting, if I can just say one more statement sure. here, uh, was about Nietzsche. And he predicted that the enlightened man would declare war on the Christian values. And actually, in... Um, the, the atheism in the true sense today, not in, in the older sense, but in the sense of you know not believing in God, uh, most atheists would say that it's not, it's not that they would dismiss those values, the virtues of love and pity. They would say that we don't need the Bible as a moral authority to make us good, good, good people. We can be good on our own. Yeah. So and, and uh, Nietzsche was kind of wrong in that yeah. sense. And I'm glad you brought that up because I think if you know some atheists, you understand that they're not bad people. Yeah, most of them do good things, and yeah. yeah, yes. I mean, I mean, there's bad people in every faith and belief. So, but most of them really are, you know, really want good things to happen, and it's just their perspective. So. Reminds me of the old Christmas song, Be Good for Goodness Sake. Yeah. <laughs> good point. Well, there's a kind of an arrogant view of Christians to think that only Christians can have ethics. Well, yeah, and that's that's what modern day atheists would say. You know, how, how, how do you think I can't be an ethical person with values just because I don't accept your God? Right, right. It's also would you say that most um, atheists would consider themselves humanists then? Is that kind of their viewpoint, humanism? Well, my, I mean, my perspective is probably kind of biased because the only atheists I know anything about are the ones that post things on Facebook. So <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know if that... They're social. I, yeah, I don't know if, if that you know, represents all atheists, I, I would say for the atheists who uh, post, you know, that, that I see on Facebook sometimes, and I'm trying to mm -hmm. think, uh, who's the British scientist that um, goes around giving talks, Dar and I, what's his name? Anyway, I can't think of his name, I'll think of it in a minute. Um, but I would say he fits Bill in. Bill Tyson. Hmm? 
your guy, your guy Neil deGrasse Tyson, isn't he an atheist? He doesn't advertise himself as an atheist. He's a Huxleyan agnostic, is what he says. Oh, okay. Isn't there somebody named Hicks? Hicks? Yeah. Well, uh, I'll look it up here. I don't remember. Okay. Good, good discussion. But, uh, I, I know an atheist, and uh, she just doesn't believe there is a supreme being in control. That whole concept just doesn't resonate with her, but she believes that people should strive for the greater good. <laughs> right, right. So, so the ones that I the one I was thinking of is Richard Dawkins. Yes, the, the one you were thinking of, Dennis, was Christopher. Well, but yeah, he's one of them. But there's another one called John Hick that is, okay. I believe, um, an and Daniel Dennett was another one. I think I believe he's passed away, and Bertrand Russell was another one. But uh, those yeah, are Bertrand Russell. Yes, the information about sometimes on Facebook. Yeah, I was in a, um, a a presentation, and I don't even remember what the the content of it was, but it was at the college, and and it, there were a lot of. I think it was it was about Islam or something like that. But there were atheists in the audience that were expressing their feelings about different things, and so it really gave me a different sense too, as well about you know some of their their feelings. So let's see. Well, and I suppose too, atheism, it, it depends on what um, definition of God has been presented to them. I mean, there are a lot of different views of who or what God or supreme being even is. Well, but not all of those definitions work for everybody. Well, and, and atheism, it says that they don't believe in a deity, meaning, you know, mm -hmm. God or, or being is what that means versus an agnostic that doesn't disbelieve, but they just don't believe as well. So, um, Okay, so that kind of shows you the, the trend that's going on historically. So these are more of the people that are more of the players and, and we're gonna go through this historically as well. Some of the philosophers and the scientists and how they affected Judaism as well. Before we get too far, I saw this graffiti that said, God is dead, and underneath it said Nietzsche, and then underneath that was written, Nietzsche is dead, and underneath that said God. <laughs> <laughs> and that's verified. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay, well, you have to laugh sometimes. <laughs> Okay, so this is Judaism, and, and Hegel plays an important role in Judaism. He's a philosopher, but, um, and um, his philosophy is similar to Kabbalah. Um, he had regarded Judaism as an, a noble religion, a primitive conception that perpetrated great wrong and was a, a tyrant. Christians had fallen to, this, to the same belief. So he thought this was, this was really wrong. And so Hegel um, said that it was a, a, an accurate view based on the New Testament attack. And uh, it was a new type of metaphysical um, anti-Semitism. So he was really um, playing against um, his own faith because he he did practice or I think evolved a philosophy similar to Kabbalah and Kabbalah was a Jewish based um, practice so um, as Kabbalah the spirit was willing to suffer limitation and exile and achieve the true spirit the spirit depended on the world and human beings for its fulfillment. 
seeing Blake saw humanity and, and spirit, finite, infinite, as mutually interdependent and involved in the same process as self-realization. Hegel was a man of enlightenment and as well as a romantic, which is really the period that's evolving and therefore valued reason more than imagination. And imagination is really kind of the romantic period that's starting to evolve. So um, Arthur Schwepenhauer um, scheduled his lectures at the same time as Hegel in 1819 in Berlin. And he believed that there was no absolute, no reason, no God, no spirit at work in the world. He believed Hinduism and Buddhism and Christians that asserted everything was vanity had arrived at a just conception of reality. They claimed everything in the world was an illusion. Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer, sorry, um, had had no time for Judaism and Islam. Many had no longer subscribed to God, who is Lord of history, is what he was saying. Um, however, his view of salvation was close to Jewish and Muslim, the perceptions that individuals must create a sense of ultimate meaning for themselves. So you'll, you'll see in these, these different beliefs how they kind of sometimes contradict themselves a little bit. Um, Schopenhauer could, could not deal with human beings and he became a recluse later on and only talked to his, his poodle, Adamant. So <laughs> I, I, I did a little bit of, um, looked up some of these, these people and added some interesting little tidbits in here. Um, It'd be interesting to know if these people, these, you know, hugely intellectuals were born in today's time and what religion is today compared to what it was back then, you know, the movements that were going on, you know, how much difference their philosophies might have evolved. Yeah, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know because I don't study philosophy anymore, Jane. You're more well versed in philosophy. I don't know if they're making really strong statements about the our faith, our current faith, like they used to as it evolved, or um, not. But definitely, they were very opinionated and outspoken over time. But I think. There, things were changing so rapidly, and not that they haven't in the last 20 years with computers, but it's interesting. You know, um, several of the people in this time period um, downplayed the concept of, of God of history. And part of that was a reaction to events that were taking place. Uh, Jews went through that early, earlier, uh, people in history. Basically, when they went into ex exile, all of a sudden, God of history, God was not in charge of history anymore. Uh, when you go through the Holocaust, it's hard to believe that God is the God of history. When you have a 9-11 attack, it's hard to believe that God is the God of, the of, of history. And so all through this time period, and even into our own day, I think many people question the concept of God if God is in control, then he's the God of history, and he controls history. So that's where a lot of these folks are reacting to that one way or another. In some, in some cases, they're going to the very like, mystical approach, where it's, it's, a, it's a God who uh, is sitting out there, and I can reach as an individual for personal enlightenment, <laughs> control, and he has no intention of, of controlling all the activities of history, for what it's worth. Yeah, that's that's a good point because I think some of them make the statement about you know 
that they believe or they don't believe in the God of history. And that's really what they're talking about is if God is in control, you know. Why do evil things happen? Yeah, why do evil things happen? So also if everything is preordained, why does it happen? So Marilyn, uh -huh. what has, what strikes me in my, my political, I had a lot of political philosophy classes in college, which was a long time ago. But what what still strikes me when I when I learn about these philosophers like Hegel and Marx is how, you know, they led to political movements, you know, because Lenin followed Hegel and Marx. And so we've got the communist viewpoint, you know, and, and, and of course, then you really look at how America and Russia went so many different directions and how, you know, even to this day, we say communists are the godless ones because of these philosophers who kind of developed what the, what the communist thought process was, you know? And um, so it was really, I, considered the Russian revolution more of a political philo philosophical re revolution you know and so I, I just find it interesting that they went to that that extreme of saying um, there was no God and now Americans think that they're the evil ones because they're atheists that, that's kind of what you look at our history and that's what all developed from that. Yeah. I found it I found it interesting when I was in Russia that in the tourist uh, stores they had all these little figures of the devil. I uh, found that very interesting. Huh. Interesting. But what year was that? That was uh Let's see, it was just after Nixon opened the Iron Curtain. So that was about 72, seven, yeah, about 72. That's interesting. Huh. That was Reagan, wasn't it? Or, um, no. Here's was, the Berlin Wall. It was Nixon. I think. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it is interesting because these philosophers right now are criticizing the Western. Christianity and the Western view things. So, um, and then of course the Westerns are, are going to turn around and, and criticize them, as you said, Jane. And so it is, it is pretty interesting. Um, and you'll see this history changes the way that the Jewish people view their faith and how they um, perceive it and talk about it as well. So, um, uh, Ludwig um, Gerbach was a German philosopher, and he indicated that God was just a human projection in his book, The Essence of Christianity in 1841. He said there's a weakness in the Western tradition that's dangerous to monotheism, and that God, <laughs> infin in and the, um, God was infinite, man was infinite, God Almighty, man weak, um, God holy, man sinful, the result in the creation of, a, of an idol. Then Solon Kierkegaard was a Danish philosopher who said old, that old creeds and doctrines had become idols. Then of course, Karl Marx saw religion as the sigh of the oppressed creature. It was the opium of the people, even though he adopted the Messianic Judaism view of history, he dismissed God as irrelevant, a God who condones social injustice would have appalled Amos, Isaiah, and Muhammad, who used God to a different end, close to the Marxist ideal. We have to remember when they're saying Western, that doesn't necessarily mean America. <laughs> right. <laughs> because um, England would be their Western. Right, yeah. right. It's a, it's a good point. Over there. Yes. 
So in ter um, the term Judeo-Christian uh, first appears in a letter from Alexander McCall in 1821, the term in this case referred to Jewish converts to Christianity. The term was similarly used by Joseph Wolf in 1829 in reference to a type of, of church that would observe some Jewish traditions in order to convert Jews. So it was a, like a Christian church that observed Jewish traditions because they were trying to convert Jews to Christianity. Carl Lyle's Principles of Geography um, start revealed geological time, how time was different in geological areas. Um, Jews in Europe had been, this is a 1941 is when the uh, Jews in Europe had been affected by a lot of hostile criticism. Again, Christian churches are trying to convert them. There's there's a lot of anti-Semitism remarks going on. In Germany, Jewish philosophers developed the science of Judaism, which rewrote Jewish history in Hegel. That's a Hegel. Hegelian terms. Um, again, uh, George Willem Hegel, who thought Judaism was uh, an, a noble religion and it was primitive conception of God. So he's, he's rewriting it to uh, include science, the new sciences in Judaism as opposed to the more what he calls a primitive uh, belief in in a, a god of history, a god of uh, uh, a warring god, an angry god. It's interesting also the uh, Lyle's principles of theology. What it what it really focused on was that those was it four thousand four years. The, uh, some Bibles refer to as the beginning of, of uh, creation, and that somehow geology <laughs> thing the earth is older than that. And that's, that's what threw many people from uh, believing the God of history into this concept that maybe science is, is the new God. Science has the answer. Good explanation. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Now it starts getting interesting. Um, 19, in 1841, Solomon Hornstecker wrote The Religion of the Spirit in 1841. He wanted to rewrite Jewish history to prove Hegel was incorrect about the Jewish conception of God being primitive. He described God as a world soul, eminent in all things. He said that the spirit didn't depend on the world as Hegel had written, but lay beyond the reach of reason. Reverting to an old distinction between God's essence and his activity. Isn't it interesting that the, the concept of the force that comes out in Star Wars goes back to the 1800s where we're talking about a, a world soul. It, it's just interesting all the way through they, they talk about uh, this force that connects and binds all of us uh, as being, in a sense, God. Yeah. Um, Formstetz uses symbolism to talk about God. And um, since he lay beyond the reach of physical concepts, Hegel used a representational language. Um, Formstetter wrote uh, Judaism had been the first religion to arrive at the advanced conception of the divine and would show the world that um, what a truly spiritual religion was like. And then um, the Jewish confidence was dealt a big blow in, in 1881 uh, with the outbreak of anti-Semitism in, in Russia and the Eastern and Eastern Europe under Tsar Alexander. 
and spread to Western Europe and France. Then in 1884, four years later, an anti-Semitic was elected mayor of Vienna. Yet in Germany, before Adolf Hitler came to power, Jews assumed that they were safe. So this is kind of what was going on with, with the Jewish faith and, all, and how it affected the, their religion at the time and the philosophers and scientists that affected it. Any comments about the Jewish history? Well, it's interesting that Bonn's director is, is uh, reviving the fact that Judaism is, uh, is uh, proper, not a primitive religion, and uh, and then and basically he's reaffirming a god of history. And then uh, 40 years later, they're starting to see uh, the Jews are being expelled from countries that were, uh, in some sense, exterminated, and that does away with that concept that you know God is protecting us. You know, we're we're his chosen people. Therefore it becomes a question, is God still a, a God of history? Yeah. I mean I, I the thing that I really struck me was the the Superman concept that they were talking about and how later Germany really picked that up and that ideology of the 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 perfect man or who that was and who was not perfect. Um, <clears throat> made them wonder what the Jews were chosen for. <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's interesting to me to call Judaism a primitive religion because Judaism, you know, the early, well, Abraham in that time period really brought civilization out of um, the pagan period into the monotheism period. That seems very progressive to me. And yet why you know, historically have the Jews been hated so much? Is it something that one group sees in another group that they see in themselves and they're not willing to accept? You know, if you're a Christian uh, monotheist of sorts uh, and you see that the Jews believe the same thing that you do on so many things, um, you, you reject that because they're Jews and, and you're a Christian. I'm just trying to figure out why. Yeah, I, know, I, I agree. Why, why, I'm why are the Jews it. always the ones that got picked on? Yeah, I mean, throughout history. His, throughout history, yeah. right. Well, they were there, and all the new ones came. So somebody had to be. Somebody had to be. Somebody <laughs> had to be worse than the, the yeah. new ones. Well, or the or something. Well, the, yeah. yeah, they forget Jesus was Jewish, and yeah. then he. Or, do you think it has anything to do with when people say they're chosen? Sometimes that doesn't necessarily, and I don't know if Jews think this way, that they're better or special, but other people kind of assume that that's what they mean. And when you, so it implies that they're better than you. So then you kind of resent that. Well, we, well, we kind of had that in Nauvoo in our church, in our background. <laughs> and they always, yeah. they always <laughs> seem to be in the lead in financial uh, areas and we're doing doing good financially. So maybe uh, so maybe people jealousy. don't like other people who are successful if they're not successful. Well, they're, well plus they always go back to, they killed Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're, they were only in banking and things because they weren't allowed to own land. So they go where they can to support their families and then they're resented for that. And that's what they were forced into doing. It wasn't even their choice. Yeah, I suspect there are a lot of reasons Oh. And I think part of it is, uh, as Dennis was suggesting, the arrogance of saying you're the chosen people. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, set apart, God has a special role for us in history. Uh, same thing that, uh, as Paul mentioned, uh, the Mormons, the early Mormons went through. You know, you, if you set yourself up as special, somebody's going to take you down a notch. King of the Mormons. think you're arrogant. <laughs> But here again, there's an element of projection because everybody thinks they're special. Yeah, yeah. it's you know it's like the uh, the concept of election. If you're an American, you know you're a member of this elect group of people that's not living somewhere else off of this North American continent. So sometimes I think the things that we can't stand in others are the things that bother us about ourselves. Yeah. 
you know, to get psychological. I think that's true. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Because those are the things that you can identify with. Okay. Any other questions about Christianity or Judaism or comments? If not, I'm going to move on to the Muslim history. No, I'm not. <laughs> I thought I was done. That's it. Oh, I got a little bit more than I realized. Okay. Okay. So, um, so in 1886 um, or a little bit later, Franz Rosenzweig developed an entirely different conception of Judaism, setting him apart from others. Um, he was one of the first existentialists, and that was a form of um, philosophical inquiry during the, eight, the 19th and the 20th century and explored the problem of human existence and centers on an experience of thinking, feeling, and, and acting. Uh, Rosenzweig also formulated the idea of ideas close to the uh, Oriental religion. He left Judaism as a young man, became an agnostic, and remember that was not someone that believed or disbelieved in God, and then um, then he considered converting to Christianity before he returned to Orthodox Judaism. So he kind of went the full spectrum, although he didn't study the Muslim faith. So um, anyway, he, he denied the observance of the Torah was slavish, which was something that was being criticized by the philosophers at the time and his dependence upon uh, tyrannical God. Religion is not about morality, but a, meet, a meeting with the divine. This is more about Rosenzweig. Um, he, distrusted, he distrusted Hegel's attempt to merge spirit with man and nature by saying that we, if we simply see the consciousness of an aspect of the, the world soul, we are no longer truly individuals. So uh, let's see, Rosenzweig being the existentialist emphasizes absolute isolation of everything, every single human being. Each one of us is alone, lost, terrified, and only when God turns to us, we are redeemed from his anonymity and fear. God enables us to attain full self-consciousness. The Torah is not prescriptive, but, a sac but is sacramental. And they are symbolic actions that point beyond themselves and introduce Jews to the divine dimension that underlies each of us. So he's really trying to help the Jewish faith. The commandments are symbolic since they often have no meaning in themselves. They drive us beyond our words to the ineffable being. Israel, he argued, had become a people in Egypt, not in the promised land and would, would not fulfill its destiny if it severed its ties with the mundane world and did not get involved in politics. So this is where the promised land starts coming into play again and, and returning to the promised land. Um, in 1882, the year after the first pogroms in Russia, a, a band of Jews left Eastern Europe uh, to settle in Palestine. And I didn't know this word before, but pogrom is a, a violent riot, riot incited with the aim of massacring and expelling an, an ethnic or religious group, particularly Jews. Um, it's demonstrated in the wedding scene in Fiddler on the Roof. Ah. If you ever remember seeing that. Okay. That was pogrom. Okay. And of course, it, it's interesting, again, here we are talking about <clears throat> Jews and Jews being um, selected to be persecuted. So um, 
Jews were convinced that they would, would be alienated until they, they had a country of their own. So you see this evolving, um, the yearning for the return to Zion, one of the hills in Jerusalem um, began as a secular movement and convinced them that the religion and God did not work. In Russia and Eastern Europe, Zionism was a result of revolutionary socialism that was putting Karl Marx theories into practice. I thought that was fascinating. I did not know that. I'm not well versed in the history of modern Israel, but I, I guess in my mind, I always equated a Zionist with somebody who was like a religious zealot, and they're not at all. It's uh, they're they're kind of more Marxist socialists, and it was out of that that um, you know living in the communes and all the things that. Um, sort of sustained Israel since the 1940s to make them strong enough to, you know, stand up to all the other countries that were antagonizing them. Right. You know, it's, it really has nothing to do with religious faith. So I, I learned a big thing there. <laughs> yeah, it, I find it really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, the spectrum of believers, Jewish believers. I mean, it's all over. It's everywhere. Yeah. 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 For us, it's huge. Yeah. And I, I thought it was interesting too that they kind of, the Zionists came to the conclusion that if God's not going to be for us and do it for us, we'll do it ourselves. Yeah. Well, and it's almost like they were trying to build a shelter. You yeah. know, they were trying, they thought if they could somehow collectively survive yeah. or collectively get um, together, they could protect themselves. It, it's interesting that there's that. That constant battle between the existentialists, the Zionists, the believers in a Superman uh, concept, and the religious sorts. You know, one basically saying man stands on his own, he accomplishes what he needs to accomplish on his own, the other saying God guides us, God's you know, spirit is needed, you know, et cetera. And that, that conflict seems to go throughout much of history. Well, they had been trying to be faithful, as faithful as they could for 3,000 years. And then along comes the Holocaust and 6 million of your 15, you know, 15 million in Jews at that time or something. So close to half of all the Jews died in, in the camps. You know, I think at that point you probably would say, maybe we need to change tactics here. Yeah. I, you know, and I, and I guess I see it in a new way. I, I, my personal bias when I hear about, um, you know, the Jew, the Israel, Israelis kind of extending their borders and allowing people to populate in areas that have belonged to Palestine, <clears throat> and my my sense of right and justice, you know, says they maybe shouldn't be doing that, um, but you know, some political groups in the U.S. support that very strongly, and I'm saying I don't think that was particularly right. But now I see it from their point of view, and you know this idea of protecting their borders and expanding their borders to give them self a safe haven. I guess I can, you even, can if I, even if I don't agree with it, I understand it. Yeah, you know? I think I think this helps me understand it too, because I was trying to figure this out and read it, I'll read about it a little bit more, so I understood it. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a siege mentality, isn't it? That, you know, the whole world is against you, so mm -hmm. we're going to. I, we're going to I clean think, our corner and going to make it bigger and bigger and bigger and, and protect ourselves. Well, yeah, and that's been the historical precedent. Precedent is the whole world is against them. They, yeah, yeah. You know, that's yeah. what I'm saying. I think they're they probably have some justification at yeah, least for why so. they think what they think. I think but, they were shocked when the UN voted them a, a country, and they knew that night that all guns were pointed at them. Yeah. You know, um, and they were going to be pushed into the sea, and they were like. It's us or done. Yeah. That's why this class is so fun. I always learn something. <laughs> I know. So speaking of Zionism, so um, Theodore Herschel infused Zionism with a new ideology and practical urgency. Zionism is the ideology and, and nationalist movement that espouses the establishment of and support of a Jewish state. Um, centered roughly around 
Canaan, the Holy Land, the region of Palestine, Eretz, Israel, on the, the basis of um, the long Jewish connection with the attachment to that land. Zionists mm -hmm. sought fulfillment here below instead of the transcendent God. The Hebrew term, I'm going to say this wrong, Hajshama, um, had a negative connotation in medieval Jewish philosophy, meaning attributing human or physical characteristic to God. However, it was in Zionism, it was redefined as realization, fulfillment or implementation of Israel. Holiness no longer dwelt in heaven, Palestine was Zion or the Holy Land. So don't they say the Passover is next year in Jerusalem? Say that again. So did that only start in the 1800s or had they been saying that before? Well, I think the 1800s was when some of the Jews started moving back to Palestine. Yeah, yeah. there was a big group of them that right, moved but back to Next, and, I don't know where next year service, in Jerusalem yeah, came from. I they think always, that's they always have a line there. in their in their Passover ceremony about next year in Jerusalem. So I thought it went way back, but you you shared in the 1800s. You know, I think so there was a sense of gathering after yeah. after 1949 or 47, whatever well, year the spell of the state Israel, of Israel yeah. was formed, and people. Uh -huh. You know, just like we had a gathering in our church to the center place, and I think the it, Jewish people had that same feeling for a while that they needed yeah, to time. to go to the homeland. What year is your total medical? So after the 1940s, when uh, Israel was formed, when the state of Israel was formed, I think there was a period of time where there was a sense of gathering. A lot of Jews came from Russia and. Europe and different places to inhabit Palestine and to strengthen the Jewish state. Um, and it kind of reminds me a little bit of the gather in, in the 1940s, my grandmother came to independence because there was a call at that time in the church for gathering to the center place. Now that eventually, I think after a time, either wore out or, or maybe the church leadership changed the focus. But I think sometimes when you want to be with your own people, you yeah. You know, you you make the effort to to get there, and I don't know if that's when that um, saying about Jerusalem yeah, next year in Jerusalem. Oh, I have a question. Was that were the um were our own church's um history of you know the term Zion and gathering and independence is where everyone's going to gather? Do you, was that kind of deliberately taken from what the Jewish faith was doing. I mean, the parallels seem kind of uncanny to me, you know, it's like we, when I was a high, in high school, we even sang the song by the waters of Babylon, uh -huh. um, we'll return to Zion. And, and we, we sang it as if it was, it, it referred to us. <laughs> and, well, that's what my grandmother believed that she was gathering to Zion, literally, I mean, I remember her saying those words. I, well, then the church went through the period of saying, you know, we're getting too many here at once. We need to, you need well, to ask permission. Yeah. Yeah. Before right. and is it hard? A bad example of that. But did well, Joseph, did Joseph Smith take that from what the Zionists were doing in Israel? I mean, it, it, it seems too similar, you know, for him to think of it all by himself. Well, I, I think he got that from the Old Testament. Yeah. So I looked up next year in Jerusalem, and the phrase is often used at the Passover Seder. Mm -hmm. um, and it says it was recorded first in the 15th century. Uh, so that goes way back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I think I've, I've always, I maybe that's just, who I am, but in my Mormonism, RLDSism, that we were very closely linked to Jewish heritage. Yeah. So I can see that we would we would draw in Zion into our well I think there's a beliefs. sense of pilgrimage in a lot of religions, Islam for sure. They yeah. whatever. Yeah. Well the, the the pilgrim 
Russians in, in Russia in that area were in the 1880s. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Joseph Smith, who wrote the Book of Mormon, are published in 1830. So much of his thinking had this precede mm -hmm. what was happening. You know, and, and I can remember uh, growing up thinking about uh, the prophecy, which I can't quote to you about uh, the desert show bloom and all that sort of thing, and applying that to Israel because some of that was happening. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I was born in '48. State of Israel was formed in '48, so that you know that was uh, a very conscious kind of thing going on there. So my point is, I don't think the original concept of Zion came from the Zion from Zionism. It came right. From, yeah, but well, it was adapted as as time went by, uh, more and more to focus yeah. on Israel and uh, kind of parallel that. Yeah. Well, uh, there's always. A, a sense, you know, if a community is, is being persecuted, there's strength in numbers. So yeah. the more people you have in your community, the more you can resist the right. arrows right. and daggers that are being directed at you. Yeah. They said there was at least one pro pogrom in 1820s oh. in Russia. Oh, okay. So and then it, and, and it, then Kristallnacht in oh, Germany, yeah. and then you know, right. Russians were always doing pogroms. Pro probably. A lot of immigrants came, Jewish immigrants came to America <clears throat> because of pogroms. They left. Yeah. Okay. So now um, we're, we're, that's kind of the history of Christianity and Judaism. And now we're going to go through really fast. And I, I think my slides have more stuff on them because I think there's only a handful of slides left for Islam. Um, so um, I, I wanted to put this first slide uh, of this first comment in. In 1607, the colonial period, most historians mark this as the beginning of the colonial period, 1607, when a small band of about 100 English colonists reached the coast near Chesapeake Bay and founded the first permanent English settlement in North America in Jamestown. During the colonial period, Islam was viewed as a um, fatalistic religion that was chronically opposed to progress. So I'm kind of trying to just give you a little bit of a short timeline. Um, so again, the Age of Enlightenment was 1650 to 1800. And the Romantic period that we're really talking about was 1795 to 1900. Um, in 1938 to 87, the, the Iran, Iranian reformer Jamal ad-Din uh, Afghani uh, was a successful Shiraki mystic and of uh, Shirardi. At that time, he he toured Afghanistan, Egypt, and India, and he really appealed to the Sunnis, the Shiites, the revolutionaries, the religious philosophers, and parliamentarians. So he kind of was people really liked him. Religion was essential, uh, though reform was necessary, is what he was saying around this time. Uh, he wrote a book, um, the Re the refutation of materialist um, and he knew the West valued reason and regarded Islam and Orientals and uh, as irrationals. He tried to describe Islam as the faith, faith distinguished by its, its ruthless cult of reason. So He's trying to appeal to the philosophers at that time and say that Islam is, is really based on reason. So he's going to try and write, rewrite a little bit of history and what's going on to appeal to, to others as well. And his focus is on intellectual education um, of the Muslims. It's, um, he talks about um, Christians believe that science was the enemy of faith, but Muslim mystics often use math and science as an aid to contemplation. Some orders of mystics are particularly interested in science. Um, and the Islamic world has gra 
grave reservation about Western politics, but few have problems with Western science, which was interesting. Um, and then he was excited about the contact with Western culture. He hadn't adapted a Western lifestyle, but visited Europe regularly. His goal was to advocate a return to the spirit of the prophet and the, the rightly guided caliphs. Abdu insisted on Muslim study, that Muslims study science, technology, and sex, secular philosophy. So this is, this is in um, the late 1800s and early 1900 that this is, this is going on. Sharia law must be reformed, he's saying, to enable Muslims to get the intellectual freedom they are required. So he's really ahead of his time um, with the Muslim faith. He all, but, it, but he was really well liked. Um, he tried to present Islam as a rational faith. Um, there was an attack against the philosophers. And there was a division between piety and rationalism. Muslims should return to the receptive and rational spirit of the Quran, is what he was saying. Then um, his uh, he uh, Sir Muhammad Iqbal became um, for the Muslims of India what Gandhi was to the Hindus. He was a West, he had been educated in Western education and a doctorate in philosophy. Oh no, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> so um, ever since the decline of the, the Mughal Empire in the 18th century, Muslims of India felt a false position. Iqbal tried to heal the disturbance by reconstructing Islamic principles through poetry and philosophy. Um, and remember, this is Romanticism during the time of Romanticism, which a lot of the arts are are going on at that time. He he was influenced by Nietzsche and understood the importance of individualism. In order to realize his own unique natures, humans must become more like God, more creative. They had their Sufi idol quote, the perfect man, the end of, of creation, and the purpose of its existence. Unlike Superman, who saw himself as supreme, the perfect man was characterized by his total receptivity to the absolute and would carry the masses along with them. Iqbal's misgivings about the Superman ideal were justified uh, later by later events in Germany. Then in um, 1881 and 82, the French and the British took Tunisia and Egypt. Um, and according to Lord Comer, Consul General in Egypt, the Egyptian reformer, Muhammad Abdul, it was impossible for Islam to reform itself. Muslims had little time um, to develop understanding of God in the traditional way. They engaged in struggle to catch up with the West and they saw secularism in the Western world as the answer. But what was positive in Europe could only be seen as alien and foreign in the Islamic world. I think I only have one slide left, but do we have time or not? Okay, so then the French and the British in, in 1898 took over um, Sudan and again, Libya and Morocco. Maybe I don't know if more than one slide left. Um, well, wh what do you think? Should I keep going? Okay. Okay. So then um, the new nation in 1970, a new nation in Turkey had emerged. The first founder of the 
Republic of Turkey, and later known as, well, I can't even say his name, he disestablished Islam. He made religion a purely private affair, and so he went the other direction and um, tried to force people into a Western uniform. And um, similarly, he tried, he abandoned the, the veil, um, the mullahs were forced to shave. And so all of the traditional um, celebrations were, were banned. Muslims regarded Turkey and Iran with suspicion and fascination. So most Muslims weren't buying what he was trying to say. Um, then in 1920, the French and the British carved up the Middle East, and that was called the Year of Disorder, and there was no longer confidence in their ability to contain the Western threat. Cru the crucial re religious Christianity in, is a religion of suffering and adversity. Islam is a religion of success. So, um, Shame was apparent with the ties to Europe and um, there was a lot of, of upheaval at that time. This is 1920s. I probably have gone, I think this is the, the last slide. It is the last slide. So, so basically I'm kind of gone to the end of, of the 1900s and then it just talks about several of the um, Egyptian journalists and what they said about, and their perspectives on what they said about um, what was going on. But that's a that was really a fast overview of the Muslim <laughs> <laughs> religion. But but you see a pattern that's going on and how it's affecting each of the religions. And then the religions tried to change to appease the philosophers. So um, but it was kind of the age of romanticism and but yet they were waffling back and forth. It's interesting in every religion there's this tension between those who would try to make progress and push the religion forward and those who try to hold it back and and you know hold on to the traditional values and, and Change beliefs. Change is hard. Yeah <laughs> I had to look up Sir Muhammad Iqbal because why was he a sir? Um, he was educated in in England, he got a master's degree, and then his doctorate was in Munich. But he was knighted, um, I, I assume, by the, the British king or whoever uh, for his work of poetry, works of poetry that he had written. You know, he, he did all these other things. He was uh -huh. involved in the law and, you know, so many in, in Islamic beliefs and just a, a guy who knew something about a lot of different things. But it was his poetry that got him knighted. Ah, oh, wow. It, it's interesting that, you know, it really was uh, scientific method, the development of, of, of kind of a, a wider expanse of view of what science can do and accomplish that caused all this disruption mm -hmm. in religion. So then you have to ask yourself, maybe it's answered in the next chapter, what about all the disruption that's happening with technology today? Mm -hmm. So, and how does that affect our, our belief in, in God? And I think we're out of time. Yes, yes. I just like to thank you for the class this morning, but I want to just share one something very briefly, and that is I had an opportunity to spend 18 months, a few years, in Germany back in 1953 to 55. What we were talking about this morning is, as I recall, those years has put a whole different uh, view of it than I had ever thought because of the opportunities I had to uh, meet with German people, work with them to associate with them, and also uh, visit some of their special <laughs> sites, including one of those, the, the Dachau concentration camp there. But uh, what we're talking about this morning has made me recall some of the incidents of that 18 months spent in Germany with German people and uh, what did happen and what did not happen. And uh, it certainly fits in with what we were talking about yeah. this morning. So, so yeah. That's just a personal thank you for- Oh, you're uh, welcome. Yeah, I have read a lot about World War II in the, in the last probably 
five years, my dad was at POW in, in a German prison camp. And I just have, I wish I, he just passed away last year, but I wish I would have had more time to talk to him about some of those things because I find it really interesting and, and how all of this evolved. And what, what camp was he in? Cell like 17. It was a famous one. Yeah, about two years. Okay. So, yeah, they have a recording of him on, I think Jonathan, I could share that with him on um, the Jewish Holocaust Museum okay. because they he marched um, um, for almost 200 miles um, out Martin of that Luther. camp when the Russians were right. coming and they marched them, they weren't supposed to, but they marched them past some of the Jew Jewish Holocaust um survivors as they were marching them and my dad's comments about some of that so yeah well there was a that famous william william holden movie call of 17. yeah and i don't have any doubt that that's based on true i mean yeah dramatic license obviously but well i went with him to a um cell like 17 reunion in branson and that was really good because they personally don't share details with their family, right. but they were really good with sharing things with me that my dad wouldn't share with mm -hmm. me. So I learned a lot of things that I probably mm -hmm. wouldn't. Although my dad wrote about a hundred or so pages for his kids, so they would know. He must have had a, well, he corresponded a lot at the end. And I think it made a difference because he joined this POW group and that probably helped him talk. Mm -hmm because they didn't talk. Yeah. And so he wrote a lot of stuff down and I learned a lot from that. 